with our next speaker, Professor Dr. Fuad Ismail. So thanks, Dr. Fuad, for, for, your, uh, for willing to be our lecturer today. So Prof. Fuad, uh, he is a medical lecturer at Medical Faculty, the National University of Malaysia, UKM. He has uh, more than 20 years of the clinical oncology uh, experience, and he is a head of the radiotherapy and oncology uh, departments at the UKM Medical Center. And he is one of the founding members of the Master of Clinical Oncology program at the University of Malaya. And he has more than 45 research projects and publish uh, a lot of work related to the cancer issues. And he's the chairman of the Research Active Committee at UKM and also the Senate, Senate members of the UKM. And he also the committee members for both a uh, very important uh, committee, which is a technical advisory committee for health technologies, economic evaluation, as well as the evaluation committee for specialist uh, medical qualification for oncologists at the MMA in Malaysia. Without further ado, can I invite Prof. Wat? Prof. Wat, the floor is yours. Prof. Wat? Thanks. I start sharing my slides. Yes, please. Okay. Yep, can you see it? Not at the moment. No worries. Currently, we have about 147 participants in Zoom. All right. Seems like this. the screen sharing. Yep. Looks wonderful. Prof, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I don't think I'm quite getting this one. can hear me yes yep, um, can you hear me yeah okay right okay yep. so this is the topic i was asked to talk about treatment and interruption and retreatment our combined therapy i've actually changed it just a little bit because uh, i think this is what we are interested in re-irradiation um, treatment interruptions and combined therapy i must admit i am uh, very much a clinician so i'm going to talk more on a clinical perspective rather than uh, very strongly on radio biology perspective uh, that's a bit out of my uh, scope of work. So um, we know that radiotherapy is a very important modality for cancer treatment and many studies have shown that about 50% of cancer patients need it in, uh, somewhere during their course or their journey through their cancer, either in a curative or palliative setting. We've done our own little study here in the university and our numbers also is about 50% of patients here so, uh, needing radiotherapy at some point in time. And we are doing better in terms of treatment of uh, cancer patients. So there are more long-term cancer survivors. And hence, they are now at more risk of developing either recurrent disease. Sometimes the disease come back later than you think uh, it normally does. Or they may get a new primary cancer. And part of this reason is due to some patient factors. Either some of them may have certain specific genetic abnormalities or they have a common uh, denominator, such as especially as smoking. Uh, they, uh, smoking is very pertinent in terms of re-irradiation. And smoking, as you know, may cause cancer in many different parts of your body, including oral, uh, oral cavity, lung, bladder, stomach, etc. And of, of course, some of the risks of cancer include the risk from uh, treatment, especially radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, now we need to differentiate what we mean by retreatment versus re-irradiation because uh, Peter McCallum reported some years ago on the review of over 48,000 patient records, those who received radiotherapy over a 12 year period, and they found that one in five patients or 20% needed to be retreated. 
Uh, and patients who had radical treatment had a retreatment rate of about 13% compared to 45% of those who had treatment for palliative intent. But here, this is a difference. And the retreatment rate was defined as the number of patients who were prescribed more than one course of radiotherapy. That means it may not be at the same site. It's just that you may have had one bone metastasis and later you may need um, palliative radiotherapy to another site bone metastasis. When we talk about re-irradiation, then we are looking at treatment to the same site. So because of um, increasing technology, we have better modality of radiotherapy. We have more refined radiotherapy. There's been an increase or surge in interest in re-irradiation and there's been increased frequency of re-irradiation studies in radiation oncology. <clears throat> so if you look at the sites that people most often consider for re-irradiation, they are especially the head and neck cancers, uh, one third of those brain tumors and also bone metastasis. So re-irradiation is very complex. It's a nightmare for clinicians. Yeah? It's a very difficult and complex undertaking because the patients are a vast group. They are quite heterogeneous and you know you can get the young and the old um, patients who've been smokers, uh, patients who are of variable, uh, variable fitness. They have had a lot of initial therapy before and they, have, and they may, have, may not have tolerated the initial radiotherapy well and other treatment including surgery and chemotherapy. They are older because this is a recurrence or retreatment and they may have new comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, etc. Um, the location and extent of tumors that is treated with, uh, that is to be retreated may be different. And one of the issues uh, is you are now less certain, quite often less certain where exactly the tumor starts and ends because the normal tissue planes and normal anatomy are lost due to previous therapy, especially surgery, and also uh, radiotherapy, which tend to blow out the normal tissue boundaries. So you you also have a variety of initial radiotherapy param parameters. Many of us use two grades per fraction for radical treatment, but patients who receive palliative treatment may have a variety of fractionation. And uh, sometimes even worse is that the patient may have had treatment in another center and he is well, then he comes, he's, he's moved, uh, moved from his original place of work and you can't even get the data from the old center. That, that's, that happens occasionally as well. The time from re initial radiotherapy is very important. You, the, if patient recur soon after radiotherapy, then it's probably not worth to was worth to treat so whether it's one year two years or three years but basically the longer you are from your initial radiotherapy then the better it is uh, but we are still struggling in terms of what we know but no, uh, normal tissue recovery and there is limited data a lot of the data is actually from animal models and so on so the data on re-irradiation for, for many sites is still uh, sparse so what are the risks of re-irradiation re so for a clinician, when a tumor recurs at the same area of previous radiotherapy, then we are, we are a bit stuck. This is a real dilemma whether we should repeat radiotherapy. Now, if the tumor has recurred soon after radiation, then it's, it's probably not worthwhile because this is a radio-resistant tumor. But if you have a fit patient and he has a dominant inoperable symptomatic tumor, uh, somewhere he has been irradiated before, then it's very challenging. Patients who are fit tend to live a long time and then they, they will live longer to potentially suffer the effects of cancer as well as potentially suffer the effects of your treatment to him. If the tumor is dominant, then it is an issue. If the tumor is, has disseminated throughout the body, then you know that you don't really need localized therapy. This is an indication for systemic therapy, especially chemotherapy. And as our usual uh, paradigm is whenever you have a treatment that a tumor that has recurred from, say, radiotherapy, then if it's operable, you try to remove it. Um, uh, say, a, a good tumor site would be the larynx. If you have a recurrent tumor from, from uh, post radiation, then you, you offer total laryngectomy for this patient. But if the tumor is inoperable, then it's, then it's a problem. Uh, you are stuck with either radiotherapy or systemic treatment. And of course, if the, sim, uh, the treatment is symptomatic, the, the tumor is symptomatic, then the patient does need some symptom release and you are forced to um, give, offer some treatment for them. So some of the factors to be considered when you are thinking about re-release include the tumor, 
is this a recurrence or is this a second primary? If it's a recurrence and it's a recurrent very quickly, then there's no point. This is a resistant tumor. But if re it has recurred some years later, then this tumor is moderately radiosensitive and um, retreatment may be considered. A second primary tumor means you've cured the first tumor, hopefully, and then you have a new uh, lesion which may be equally radiosensitive. Then you you are, you need to consider what is the type of tumor, whether it's a radiosensitive tumor like squamous cancer or is it radio resistant tumor. Of course, the worst scenario is usually you, when you develop a sarcoma in the in the previously irradiated field, and this tends to be radio resistant uh, to your radiotherapy and may not be worthwhile to re irradiate a previous site. And the size of the tumor, the size of the recurrence of the new tumor uh, and the volume uh, is very important because that would influence the area that you need to irradiate. And if there's any nodes involved, again, this will indicate that you need to irradiate a very large area. Yeah? And of special mention is when you have tumors in the head and neck region and you need to have local uh, radiotherapy. Uh, interestingly, um, certain organs or certain structures which you think are highly radio resistant becomes important when you are considering re irradiation and we are involved by tumor, and it's even more important to consider the possibility of um, uh, adverse events in these uh, uh, structures. Professor, sorry to yes. disturb your flow. Uh, but do you mind to unshare and then share the slide again? Uh, because uh, someone accidentally wrote on it, so it's not showing clearly. Oh, okay. All right. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. Let's see how do we do this. Okay. Okay, are we all right? Yes. Can you see the slides? Yeah, yes, okay. Perfect. Uh, can you make it into a presentation? Okay, hold on. I think I have to redo this. Just give me a second. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, is that in presentation mode? Uh, no, it's not in display mode. No. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Now, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Good. I my technical help has arrived. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think it's in presentation mode now. Yeah. Uh, Fine. Wait. 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 Show. Show. This one. This one. Go this. This. I think it's presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Share. Okay. okay, so uh, we talk about normal tissue factors, and again, um, different normal tissue can tolerate different retreatment. Yeah, they they recover at different rates, and some uh, normal tissue have limited recovery. Others have got better recovery depending on the type of tissues they are. So it depends whether they are parallel organs or serial organs. Uh, parallel organs, um, where the classical serial organ would be your spinal cord. Parallel organ will include your your lung or your liver. Um, what was the volume of tissue irradiated before? And again, time is very important. What are um, concurrent illnesses uh, of the patient, especially things which compromise the vasculature like diabetes and hypertension. You know that um, many of the late effects are due to vascular compromise and whether concurrent chemotherapy has been given before or is being planned uh, for this repeat irradiation. When considering re-irradiation, the normal tissue damage and the impact on the quality of life must be considered. There is no free lunch. There will always be some effect and how, uh, how bad it will, could it be for if you damage certain organs. You know, zero stoma is, is probably still acceptable, but having chronic skin ulceration or worse, myelopathy is definitely unacceptable. Prof. Okay. Sorry. Would you mind to click on the presentation mode again? Okay. So uh, we have the contact paper, which was published. Presentation mode, okay. How do, how do you know this is not presentation? Yeah, excellent. That's good. Okay, so you have the contact paper and we can see that the, the, this is a good summary of um, the dose uh, fractionation 
uh, well, the total dose and the risk of events, uh, especially radiation events to the different organs. So you can see that certain organs are very sensitive. Uh, brain is, is uh, can tolerate quite a lot of radiation actually, but brainstem is quite sensitive and you can see that um, about 54 to 60 grade feet the maximum that we will comfortably irradiate um, uh, brainstem or part of the brainstem. Yeah? So there, there's a lot of data in the Quantec uh, paper for, for you to make an estimate on the risk of, um, uh, of complications um, relative to the normal tissue tolerance. <coughs> Okay, so if you're thinking of goals, uh, what are the goals of re-irradiation? Number um, one is, can you still cure this person, right? So if you want to try to cure, then you want, need to control the local disease, uh, whether it's with radiation by itself, a definitive radiotherapy, or is it going to be post-salvage surgery as an adjuvant radiotherapy or adjuvant re-irradiation uh, for the patient? Or is it just for palliation, and then we want to offer a reasonable uh, length of local control and palliation of symptoms? So very careful patient selection is essential. Those who are uh, those who should not should not be related include those who are poorly. That means their uh, performance status is very poor. Um, and anybody who is performance status three definitely should not be radiated. The best is zero to one uh, equal status. Those who've had severe toxicity from previous radiotherapy and those who have uh, disseminated disease from metastatic carcinoma. So the basic principles in re-irradiation is one is never do this alone. You do need input from a lot of people, including your friendly surgeon to see whether can you offer something else? Can you offer surgery up front first instead of radiotherapy? The radiologist will, will you need a lot of help from the radiologist to really define the tumor because again, um, knowing where the tumor extent is in a recurrent situation is really quite difficult. Uh, you need to really pay careful attention uh, with maximum care to the patient and accuracy of treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by this is if normally you just do a CT scan to, uh, to see the extent of the tumor, you may need all modalities including MRI and PET scan to carefully delineate the extent of tumor with not only just um, uh, imaging but also with functional imaging. So you have to look at little, little details in the uh, dose, uh, in the target volume, because certain areas of hotspot, you don't want the hotspot to land where the previous hotspot was, or you think where the previous hotspot was. So you may want to distribute the, the damage a bit more evenly. And you, when you want to consider the risk of further late effects, hyperfractionated protocols may be considered, uh, unless you have a very, very small volume of, of disease and then you may consider very highly conformal image guided stereotactic approaches. Uh, typically would be something like doing a gamma knife for a re radiation of brain tumors. So, so it is important to look at what is the most important tissue in the area that you're going to re radiate because the probability and severity of late complication is related to the tissue hierarchy. I mentioned this before, serial organ is very sensitive to hotspot and uh, damage to a serial organ is disastrous. So if you have a, a volume which has been treated and it's a parallel system, then overdosing these areas is not as bad as overdosing organs with serial uh, functional units. Yeah? So the assessment includes the, the safety re, re irradiation it should be especially focused to these organs. Yeah? Most important would be spinal cord, brachial plexus and bowels. Although I must admit that we seldom consider re radiation in the abdomen or in the pelvis. So it's looking at spinal cord, then the long term risk is myelopathy. For the first, first um, cause of radiation, then the risk of myelopathy, if you keep the doses below somewhere between 50 or 55 days, we can argue about this, then the risk is actually very small. It's probably less than 1%, and it goes up to about 5% or less for doses up to about 60 grays. And the spinal cord does recover. Uh, so if you need to re-irradiate, uh, if it's after a year, then there is substantial recovery. And if you do re-irradiate, then you need to keep the cumulative BED below 135 grays or thereabouts. And you should never give more than the equivalent BED of 98 grays per course of treatment. So that's a spinal cord. And, and as a clinician, I must admit that this is the one that we are most paranoid about because long-term risk of myelopathy is disastrous for the patient when they become uh, uh, quadriplegic or hemiplegic or, or diaplegic. Yeah? 
The second area that we often re-irradiate is brain. And, and especially for certain tumors, let's say for uh, interesting something like lung cancer, where previously if you have brain metastasis uh, for lung cancer, usually it just means disseminated disease and the patient is likely to die of metastatic spread, but with um, increasing improvement of systemic therapies, especially the targeted therapies, seeing isolated brain um, metastasis and needing retreatment is getting to be uh, less uncommon now. So if you are treating um, uh, metastasis, uh, especially when you have used uh, whole brain radiotherapy before then, you need to consider stereotactic radio surgery of some sort. And then here, the volume of tumor becomes very important and you need to adjust your doses according to the size of the recurrent tumor. Bone metastasis is another area we, we often either retreat, that means a different site, or we need to re-irradiate. And uh, this is one of our bread and butter of radiotherapy where you get very good pain relief for treatment of bone metastasis. And many, many studies have shown that single fraction is as good as multiple fraction. However, there is uh, an increased uh, re-irradiation or retreatment um, rate with single fraction radiotherapy, which is about 20% versus just under 10% with uh, fractionated treatment. This may be a true, um, a true phenomena, or it may be because that if you have given a smaller dose to a certain area, if you're given, let's say, eight grades to a certain site in the bone, then you are... Um, less unwilling to retreat it because you still have got quite a lot of scope for uh, re-irradiation to the same area. And single, a single fraction is, is the best for, uh, in terms of logistics for the patient and the caregiver. Now, interestingly, when you start to re-irradiate, then you have to worry about certain um, new organ or new structure toxicity. Right. Many of these structures we don't really consider as important. Let's say if you give radiotherapy to the head and neck region, we seldom think about the tolerance of the carotids uh, or, or the aorta in the thorax. Uh, uh, but when you have re-radiation, then you do see some large vessel complication. And uh, arterial rupture has been seen with re-radiation in the head and neck and thoracic regions, uh, especially in the carotids and the thoracic aorta. Now, there's been very little report of, of the abdominal aorta, and it may be also a good function of, that we see we do much less uh, abdominal radiotherapy compared to thoracic or chest radiation. The reported rate for this is about 2 to 3 percent. And if you have tumors which are surrounding the vessels or if there's ulceration in the skin and previous neck dissection, and these are additional risk factors for large vessel rupture. Right? And, and if it, normally with head and neck radiotherapy, you only see risk of uh, osteoradionecrisis of about 1%. This increases rapidly with uh, re repeat radiation as well as tracheal necrosis. So I will go to the uh, main area of um, re irradiation, especially in head and neck cancers. Yeah? Uh, patient with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, SCC head and neck, are at risk of getting second round of radiotherapy because they have a a relatively high incidence of getting either a regional relapse, about 30%, or getting a second cancer, which is about 5% per year. The second cancer may be elsewhere, but they do get cancer in the same area because it's an effect, especially of smoking, where you get field cancerization and the whole uh, upper aerod digestive um, tract is affected by chronic smoking. And again, because of better radiotherapy, hopefully, um, the probability of developing um, second cancers increases as patients are surviving longer and they may also see late local regional recurrences. Is retreatment warranted? It is always a big dilemma. Is, can, uh, um, should we re-irradiate them? And, and it may be worthwhile because we can see what happens if we don't treat patients. They die quite quickly. There is no such thing as five-year overall survival uh, in general if the patient got a uh, or a new head and neck primary tumor, but in the head and neck squamous carcinoma with re-irradiation, they don't do as well, and most the median survival is less than a year, which is similar to systemic uh, therapy. So here, here lies the choice of whether you should uh, avoid re-irradiation and simply offer the patient cyst therapy uh, upfront.
So, so again, you can see on um, five-year survival is only really realistically seen when the patient can undergo surgery and followed by possibly adjuvant treatment. We've got publications which, which suggest that, um, that the newer radiation modalities may be uh, helping us to um, uh, allow get, get more patients for, for retreatment. We know IMRT can offer more conformal um, radiotherapy, and especially in the context of re radiation, you may have more constraints so that you avoid certain very vital organs, especially in the head and neck region, such as the spinal cord. And in this publication, we can see that the use of IMRT uh, versus uh, non IMRT, uh, there are better, there's a better chance of local uh, regional control with the use of IMRT um, in, in, in the head and neck region. Right. The RTOG has done a couple of big studies looking at re-irradiation um, protocols and this was uh, in the head and neck uh, um, cancers. Most of them in the oropharyngeal region and there's a lot of uh, entry criteria for, for this uh, protocol. One is, of course, it must be proven to be a recurrent squamous carcinoma and then you must, it must be a longish time interval, at least six months. And the dose of radiotherapy number seven cannot be too much. It's a maximum of 75 dose. And the anticipated cumulative spinal cord dose was limited to 50 grays. Yeah, so you can see that these are, um, uh, if we are thinking of a re radiation this again, we should look at all these criteria and think that we should try to follow this, especially the dose constraint of not too, too much dose to organs at risk. Yeah. So in the final report, um, how, uh, unfortunately, it was not too exciting because you can see that the graph of overall survival is pretty dismal. Very few patients survive uh, beyond two years. Yeah. The rate of survival of two years is only about 10% or so. And, and this is uh, uh, patients who, ha who had prior radiotherapy and recurred quickly. That means less than a year, they do very poorly. And most of them die within a year of treatment. And those who ha had uh, more than a year lapse after the initial radiotherapy do a little bit better. And by, and by the graph, you can see it is just a little bit better. And the mortality, the good thing about the mortality in the radiotherapy, I'm not taking, saying it's good to be mortality, but most of it was actually related to cancer rather than to our treatment. So that is the risk uh, why you need to consider re-radiation because patients will die of uh, uncontrolled tumor if you don't re-treat re them. So the risk uh, of mortality related to complication of the protocol was quite low, only about 10% uh, overall. However, morbidity was quite considerable and you can see here just uh, selected uh, the use of feeding tube and you can see that um, most of the patients would have needed a feeding tube at some point in time. And you can imagine, uh, it, even after the first round of radiotherapy, most of the patients have difficulty in swallowing because they have dry mouth, it's uncomfortable, they may have aspiration issues and so on. So there is considerable morbidity um, following re irradiation to the head and neck region. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there was also another uh, trial, RTOG uh, 1911, where they looked at uh, uh, re irradiation with um, platinum or uh, paclitaxel. And again, uh, similar to this, except that this was a trial where the salvage surgery was manda uh, mandatory uh, with macroscopic complete resection. And here, the radiotherapy is quite intensive. They actually had BID treatment, hypofractionated, and they received uh, 60, 60 grays of radiotherapy. And if you look at this graph, then you say, okay, that looks quite good, except that the uh, x-axis is a bit expanded. So the one-year survival is maybe about 40%, and the two years, it may be about 25% uh, overall survival. But you can see that they do recur quite rapidly, and almost two-thirds of the patient will recur by one year, and uh, seen in the PFS graph. <clears throat> Surgery. Um, uh, uh, surgery is does offer um, some advantage over just definitive irradiation. So actually, some patients that definitely irradiation, you can see that getting surgery um, improves their overall survival by about five to ten percent, and and also reduces the risk of local regional failure in these patients. Um, <coughs> In the two arms that, that were, who had surgery, one arm was actually offered chemo radiotherapy as adjuvant and the other arm was watchful waiting. 
and you can look at this graph and you can say that that yes it is good if we offer um, radiotherapy they do get improved in dfs disease free survival um, but when you treat patients for potentially a curative treatment then you have to look at the overall survival as well and here the the overall survival um, was not much different uh, within this these two arms. So, so there is always a price to pay in terms of giving treatment upfront, more, being more aggressive versus being more conservative and perhaps giving radiotherapy a bit later. Right? And you can see here the disease-free survival has improved, but there is considerable mobility, especially the lower part. You look at the skin, uh, trismus, radio osteoradio necrosis is all quite high. Osteoradio necrosis seen in 17% of the patient versus uh, watchful waiting arm, which is essentially zero. So you can improve that disease-free survival by starting treatment early um, after surgery and being more aggressive, but there is a, a price to pay in terms of long-term morbidity. And you can see here that the long-term morbidity of grade 3 toxicity is quite high at about 15% for, for these patients. But most of the patients actually succumb to the disease uh, uh, eventually, and uh, almost 70% of them. So how can we select our patients out for re-radiation? We will come across these patients, uh, these sort of patients many times, and it's always a, a dilemma in trying to persuade patients to undergo re-radiation, um, both ways actually, whether the patient wants to undergo re-radiation or whether the physician wants to re-radiate a person. So if you look at the two main um, uh, things to consider, whether they have comorbid disease, do they have bad heart, do they have bad diabetes, is there, is there any organ uh, dysfunction prior to re-radiation? And when you have um, these two factors together, then there are bad prognostic factors and essentially there are very, uh, or no survivors beyond two years uh, when they have both of these. So assuming that your patients do not have severe comorbidities, then you look, where is the recurrence? If you have isolated neck recurrence, you do better. If the tumor is smaller, then you do better. Again, this is very intuitive. And if you have a longer time interval, then again, you do better as you seen in the previous study. So you look at what's happening. So if the, uh, if the patient is being, has a recurrent tumor, then is it, when was the radiotherapy? If it's more than two years uh, and then it's resected, they do the best. Yeah, they should, you, should, uh, you can consider them for radiotherapy. But if they, they, the radiation was less than uh, two years, and there's organ dysfunction, then they do quite poorly. And you know, to give them um, radiotherapy may not be the best for them because they, they will have considerable morbidity and they will not um, survive very long either. Um, so we often use uh, cisplatin for our concurrent radiotherapy treatment. Um, I do use some carboplatin and paclitaxel as well. And we have a whole bunch of new um, agents coming out. Cetuximab was very exciting when it came out about 10 to 15 years ago. But over, over time, we can see that uh, Cetuximab is actually not much better than cisplatin. And in this re-irradiation series also, it shows that the results were similar whether you use cisplatin or Cetuximab. Okay, so that's the first part on re-irradiation. I'm going to go on to talk about a little bit about treatment interruption. This is going to be much shorter. Um, just... Uh, just to walk you through this. And we know the five hours of radiotherapy. Uh, when you give radiation, the cells uh, um, uh, survival improves after some hours because of repair of subdental damage. And if you, you re irradiate them at a certain time point, this is a two um, fraction radiotherapy, then because of reassortment, the cells become sensitive again to radiation and then the cell survival decreases again. But the last part of the graph is the part that is really important is when there is too long a gap between radiation, then there is repopulation of cells and the tumor may actually be bigger uh, uh, after the first fraction of radiotherapy. So as for us, I think we do have treatment interruption during radiotherapy. They may be planned, split cross radiotherapy um, was done in the past to reduce the acute side effect of treatment. I think split cross radiotherapy is mostly in the back burner now, and um, no one will really consider split cross radiotherapy for radical treatment. But often patients uh, may have unplanned gaps, yeah, uh, and this may be due to illness. Um, God forbid they get COVID now. Uh, or they may have severe side effects from treatment, needing hospitalization and supportive care. 
or it may be technical, partly uh, the biggest one would probably be in Malaysia, maybe holidays. And the second one is machine breakdown because many of our centers have one or two machines only. So um, the treatment time is very uh, tight and machines are often old. And why are gaps important? Gaps are really important because we do not want to increase the overall treatment time. This is a publication about uh, 30 years ago, uh, which looked at the risk of uh, repopulation in tumor. Uh, and this is by Weavers et al. And with, uh, you can see that the graph, by prolonging the treatment duration beyond about 30 days, then the total dose needed is increased from 50 grays to 70 grays by the time you hit a treatment duration of 60 days. So this was due to uh, um, uh, tumor repopulation and accelerated repopulation. So treatment interruptions are very, very important for fast growing tumor with potentially a short T-pot. The average doubling time of a squamous carcinoma is supposed to be about 30 to 60 days. But if you interrupt the cell kinetics and the tumor kinetics, then the tumors can repopulate with a, a doubling time of between four to seven days. And from the same publication, they say that uh, overall looking at the different studies, then the, the, the increment dose needed per day loss is about 0 0.6 grays. Of course, it's quite difficult to know how this means in terms of transition of, of um, local control, um, uh, but that would, that would be about 1% 1, 1 or so less local control per day loss. Okay, so this is a, this is a graph looking at the different kin the, uh, kinetics of the, the different areas. So the tumor starts to undergo accelerated repopulation in about four weeks plus minus one week. Uh, but you can see your uh, your normal tissue, your acute reacting tissue, will start to undergo a, uh, so called accelerated repopulation after about one to two weeks. So, so in terms of um, uh, treatment, uh, if you prolong the treatment too long, then both these tissue, two tissue, the tumor tissue and the normal tissue are um, repopulation, repopulating at a fast rate. So therefore, uh, for head and neck cancer, it is best to try to complete your treatment in the shortest time possible. If you do have a gap and you need to compensate for it, there are a few ways that you can do it. Uh, sorry. Uh, one is you can increase the fraction size, but unfortunately, if you increase the fraction size to catch up for the lost days, then you run into a different problem because mm -hmm. the different tissues have got uh, different sensitivity to increasing or different fraction sizes. You know that the late reacting tissues are more sensitive to fraction size, and uh, if possible, that it's best to maintain the overall treatment and fraction size. This is the easiest. Uh, scheme, but it is easier said than done. If the gap occurs early in the treatment, then we have the luxury that we can treat twice a day with minimum of six hours or better eight hours between fractions. And and some uh, we although mostly we work five day week, but we can actually uh, force um, not quite force, but we can we can ask the radiographer nicely to treat patients on Saturdays uh, for those who are on radical radiotherapy. But whatever it is, as a general rule, try not to treat more than six fractions a week because then the toxicity would increase. Yeah? So overall treatment time is very, very important for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck and also of the cervix. For every day uh, of prolongation of the treatment time, then local control is decreased by about 1.5% 1 1 for head and neck tumors and by about 0.5 to 1% for um, cervical carcinomas. For other tissues like say like breast or prostate tumors, the rapid proliferation is not seen, so compensation is not as crucial. So if you need to make a judgment, both um, breast is undergoing ra uh, adjuvant radiotherapy and prostate cancer is uh, undergoing radical radiotherapy, but your machine needs to be fixed and it will take half the day. So you do need to um, prioritize your uh, head and neck cancers uh, and your cervical carcinomas. Okay, I'm going to move on to the combined modalities. Here, I'm not going to talk about uh, surgery. I'm going to talk about more of the combining drugs with radiation. Yeah? We do combine surgery and other form of treatment with radiotherapy, but drug radiation interaction is important. And many drugs can cause modification of cellular response to radiotherapy. And we have many, many new drugs which can potentially be used as radiation sensitizer. Basically, a sensitizer is any drug or any agent that increases the sensitivity of radi cells to radiation. And a protector is one that reduces the sensitivity. So this is our typical dose response curve of um, tumors. Uh, or even normal tissue is, uh, we think it follows a sigmoidal pattern. Where, uh, the stiffness of the graph may vary. Yeah. 
So you start to see, you hope, at least you hope you start to see complications after you start to cure some patients of their tumors. Right? So the complications hopefully come later. Yeah? So you, you select a, a, a good dose where you want to cure a certain number of tumors, but at the same time, not run into too many complications. I think a 5% risk of late complication is what is acceptable. Okay? If you have a radiosensitive tumor, then that's nice. If you have a lymphoma, then you can cure most of them with radiotherapy, provided they're localized, and you run to very little risk of complications. But if you have a very radioresistant tumor, then the graph may be very close to your normal tissue tolerance, and it is difficult to cure this patient without running into late complications. So you want to use drugs to uh, help your radiotherapy make it better. It is synergistic. It may work by preventing repair of radiation-induced damage. Um, classical would be cisplatinum. It may synchronize cells into radiation-sensitive phase. Remember the graph I showed earlier that certain phases of radiotherapy is more sensitive, especially G2. And then you may want to use the drug to prevent repopulation. Um, we know that hypoxic cells are um, more radio resistant and some drugs may help to reduce the fraction of hypoptic cells or sensitize them to radiotherapy. And of course, the drugs may work independently and kill cells which may be potentially radio resistant, but they may, they may be chemosensitive. So some of the potential disadvantages include that once you give chemotherapy, especially in the new adjuvant uh, setting, you may select out the chemo resistant and there are also radio resistant clones. Yeah. And if you give uh, chemotherapy, you have changed the cell kinetics, and by the time you start radiotherapy, you may have induced accelerated repopulation. And now you are playing a game of catching up, trying to give enough radiotherapy to control the tumor, although it is smaller. Then, of course, if you give chemotherapy, apart from sensitizing the tumor, you may also sensitize your normal tissues, and then you lose any advantage of uh, adding chemotherapy. And giving chemotherapy to patients may make them weaker. They may be having a severe side effects on chemotherapy, unable to eat, and therefore the tolerance to overall treatment, especially to radiation, becomes less. Right. So chemotherapy can interact with radiotherapy in different ways. Special cooperation means they work at different sites. A classical example would be leukemia, where, where previously we used to irradiate um, the brains of children. That hence, the chemotherapy work in the rest of the body and radiotherapy will be given as prophylaxis mm -hmm. for potential intracranial disease. Chemotherapy can work on as independent uh, from radiotherapy, affecting different cell population. Those, some may be sensitive to chemo, some may be sensitive to radiotherapy. Um, uh, drugs may be protecting normal tissue and hopefully not protecting tumor tissue. And drugs, we want them to enhance the tumor response to our radiation. <clears throat> So I've mentioned this already, and leukemia, uh, and uh, uh, when you say it's non-interaction, the chemotherapy and radiotherapy are working completely independent of each other at different sites. Uh, again, this is, I've mentioned this. Uh, so we are, when we combine um, um, modalities, um, previously in the 70s and 80s, when the interaction was not well known, we used to, the studies used to reduce the dose of radiation because we were worried about long-term uh, side effects when you use two modalities together. Now we know that in general, radiation and chemotherapy should be given, the, at least the radiation should be given at a full dose, where if you are looking for independent therapy, you also give chemotherapy at full doses, but perhaps not together with radiotherapy. Yeah, But we need to keep an eye uh, on the toxicity and in general, you look for drugs which have different toxicity from radiotherapy. If you are irradiating the chest, you try to give drugs which uh, do not have uh, severe pulmonary toxicity and, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> so certain drugs need to be avoided when you give concurrently with radiotherapy, especially in antibiotics. I would be really scared of giving either doxorubicin or epirubicin or even gemcitabine with uh, radiotherapy. And then you avoid drugs with recognized toxicity, giving methotrexate um, with radiation to the head and neck or to the spinal cord is probably not a good idea, or cyclophosphamide or bleomycin when you give lung radiation. And sometimes you may need to avoid concurrent treatment with these drugs. Okay, so. We do use quite a lot of, of concurrent chemo radiotherapy nowadays, and the idea of giving a radiation sensitizer is to increase the tumor response more, uh, more than uh, with either chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But again, this is with a caveat of for a certain given complication rate. So the 
complication rate may rise as well, but the complication rate must not be rising faster uh, than the, tu uh, the tumor response rate. So the tumor response must be more than normal tissue toxicity, hence you get a therapeutic gain. So you're looking for uh, either a synergistic or uh, an additive uh, effect on this, uh, on this um, combination therapy. Now, the problem is it is easy to show this effect if your dose response curve is linear, but the dose response curve for different tumors is, uh, or different uh, normal tissue is not linear and for tumors it's not linear either. Uh, so you may get organs which are very radio sensitive, like say like the bone marrow. So any changes in the radiation dose greatly affect the bone marrow, while the lung, the curve, the dose response curve for lung may be less steep and dose response curve for uh, skin um, is even less steep and hence you have uh, you have both the luxury of increasing the dose, but at the same time, it is more difficult to predict where the effect of the interaction would be in, uh, for different um, tissues. So if you look at bone marrow, a small increase for one gray can increase the toxi uh, toxicity or the late complication for practically zero to 50%, and two grays increase may, may make it up to 100% compared to lung or other organs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I work Current thinking about drug and radiation is usually concurrent. We do use quite a bit of sequential, um, uh, but the advantage of adjuvant uh, and new adjuvant treatment for, uh, especially for uh, head and neck cancers and squamous cancers, is much smaller than the advantage of giving concurrent treatment. And the main uh, advantage is probably the prevention of repair for, of radiation induced, induced damage, especially by cisplatin. Uh, perhaps there is a little bit of prevention of repopulation, or, um, although I must say I think this is a very minor because the dose of platinum use is usually low per week. Um, and of course, there may be a little bit of effect of cy uh, cytotoxicity. So if you are using a radiation sensitizer, the, it is, ideally it should be selective in tumors, no effect on normal tissue. It should reach tumors in adequate concentration, and we know that tumors are often hypovascularized and hence drugs may not reach them in adequate concentration. You must also know when they are reaching the tumor so that you can time the radiotherapy. Um, this, is, this is more towards uh, radiation protector, protector rather than sensitizers. And you should be able to uh, administer the radiation sensitizer ideally with every treatment, but in general, that's not very practical. So uh, many of our regimes, we use it weekly, especially the infusional regime. And hopefully the drug itself it has little toxicity and we can manage the enhancement of uh, radiotherapy uh, if it's predictable. Yeah. So I'm going to skip this and look at this. Uh, some kind of the categories of radiation sensitizers include the halogenous pyrimidine. Uh, the main one would be 5-fluorouracil and all the similar products. Repair inhibition, cisplatin is our main drug now, and they form the any crosslink inhibiting repair radiation damage. Um, we do use some paclitaxel, and cell, cellular studies show that you can use paclitaxel to induce a G2M block. Uh, and then this is the more sensitive, radio sensitive phase of the cell cycle. But in, in the clinic and in, uh, in a tumor in situ in your patient, it is very difficult to predict when the G2M block will happen and, and so it, it, this is probably not the main mechanism. We've seen these results with cisplatinum in many tumor sites. Now this is a publication over 20 years ago looking at effect of cisplatin in cervical cancer and there are many publications showing an advantage of about between 5 to 15 percent in terms of improved uh, treatment with cisplatin. This particular trial was the effect of pelvic radiotherapy, chemotherapy versus extended field radiotherapy just by itself. Yeah. So currently we are using um, mainly chemotherapy with um, uh, 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 concurrently with radiation for cervical cancer, esophagus, inner cancer, head and neck cancer, um, uh, non small cell, small cell lung cancer, and uh, for us um, especially in NPCs, initial cancer. cancers. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, uh, when we were uh, when the initial publication of concurrent chemo radiotherapy came out, many worried about late effect on bowel and bladder toxicity. We know that there is an increased acute effect with chemotherapy, but most of these are hematological and uh, uh, limited. But late toxicity has not been uh, too much of an issue with um, uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy. We also know that, that we need to maintain the dose of radiotherapy to the full dose. 
And we, we have to be extra careful that the chemotherapy is not making the patient weaker and hence and needing to uh, prolong treatment time. So if you do need to stop one treatment, you need to stop the chemotherapy and not the radiotherapy. So we have evidence looking at the data supporting combining chemo and radiotherapy together. Glioblastoma use a lot of timosolomide. Many of the other cancers we use. Um, uh, cis cisplatin, we use uh, in inner in cancer, we, we use mitomycin C, and rectal cancer, we use more fluoridocil or uh, capecitabine. And some of the use of these combined modalities may be to um, limit your toxicity with one modality. Well, one good example would be for uh, lymphoma, where you give your uh, chemotherapy as a main treatment, and sometimes you have um, chemo resistant disease and you can top it up or give some uh, curative radiotherapy for localized disease. So this may be some of the advantage. You can reduce the, the dose of chemotherapy, the cycles of chemotherapy may reduce the exposure to certain drugs causing my cardiomyopathy by giving them radiation instead of, of chemotherapy. So, but again, um, uh, there is the price to pay. So giving two modalities means you do add the to toxicity. So if you give a, a, a doxorubicin with radiotherapy, there, is, mm -hmm. there, there may be recall reaction and there may be some different late toxicities to the heart as well. As if you give, uh, let's say for breast cancer, you give um, uh, doxorubicin followed by chest wall radiation. So that may add some toxicity to the heart as well. So always consider what is the or potential short and long term side effects when you give uh, chemotherapy with radiotherapy in, in whatever sequence. Yeah. So, uh, overall, however, again, as I said, in the right context, you do see an improvement in therapeutic death. This is what I'm alluding to. We can see that the therapeutic death is low in terms of acute side effects because you are getting much more side effects from chemotherapy, but these are limited. But more importantly, the late is uh, effect now you can see that the effect with radiotherapy alone, the effect, uh, the ratio, the rate is similar to giving with, is with chemo radiotherapy. So this is a, a pattern that we've seen across many tumor sites. And uh, as radiation oncologists, most of us are uh, use a lot of concurrent chemo radiotherapy as a preferred modality. So in summary, uh, if you for re-radiation. Uh, patient selection is really, really important. Uh, pa patient need to be fit and you need careful counseling on risk. I didn't mention risk, which include uh, potential, um, uh, not just uh, in terms of for the patient, but in terms of for your career. A uh, very realistic risk is uh, the risk of litigation if things go wrong with re radiation. Right? So issues with radiation include the longer treatment time interval. So you try to read a patient who has at least one year from previous radiation. If you need to re irradiate, you irradiate only the tumor. You don't. You generally don't do prophylactic nodal irradiation. Just whatever you see, so what, uh, that's what you irradiate. Uh, look at the OAR, mm -hmm. the organs at risk, and especially serial organs. Then those tolerances must be respected. Consider hyperfractionation and you know uh, maybe BID treatment or something to to um, maintain your overall treatment time. Yeah, so you need to pay attention, a lot of attention to supportive care and quality of life issues. Many of these patients will need supportive care in terms of feeding especially. And you need diligent documentation and reporting, especially the documentation because you need to show that you have uh, given consideration to all your organ tolerances because you remember that these patients are at very high risk of getting complications and you know um, uh, the, the potential uh, uh, difficulties ahead for yourself uh, when complications occur. So for, for chemo radiotherapy, so addition of drugs or chemotherapy with radiotherapy may uh, result in interactive or non-interactive uh, interactive. Here, what I mean is the drugs may work independently of radiotherapy or together with radiotherapy. Uh, I actually didn't mention much about radiation protector because uh, for me, I think they've come and gone. There's not much um, uh, interest in radiation protector nowadays. Uh, Non-interactive processes can be uh, has been demonstrated to have clinical beneficial effect. I mean, non, uh, um, you 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 can use radiotherapy and chemotherapy separately. You must remember this concept of therapeutic gain, and it's only achieved if your your chemotherapy or drug results in an increased response relative to the increase in toxicity uh, to the normal tissues. Yeah. Uh, cis platinum and platinum combination so far for, for me at least uh, are the most useful um, drugs for concurrent treatment in several different sites of the body, including head and neck, chest, and cervix. So, thank you very much. Uh, 